Thank you very much, Valeria, for a great talk. So far, we have been <clears throat> discussing theories and fictions in philosophy, the visual arts, architecture, and literature. And you have brought in now the, challenge, the challenges of reality. So I think this is a really important, really important aspect of our conference. Are there questions, Kathleen? It would be interesting to look at how Europeans are reacting to what's being known about other cultures where self-mutilation is common and, and it, it, finding out about things like um, you know, Americans who would pierce themselves and put feathers and ornaments and encountering people in Africa who were doing the same. I know this is, um, this is something that, I, that is described and talked about in European sources at the time. So, is that something that you've looked at to see what the reaction is to self-mutilation um, in, in Europe? And did people ever participate in that kind of thing in Europe, self-mutilation, as a, as a form of beauty? In which period? In, in the Renaissance. Um, if uh, uh, regular people mutilated themselves for reason of uh, religion uh, or uh, well, I was just curious if it ever happened and, and what, the, what the reaction was when people described other people mutilating themselves as a form of beauty, if that's something you've looked at. Um, for Christian, self-mutilation, it's a sin, okay? So, for example, suicide was practiced among the Roman and became a sin among the, the Christians. So, I... Um, uh, the only time I encountered self-mutilation was in the case of, uh, as I said, of nuns who would mutilate themselves when they knew they were going to be raped. And in fact, the convents in the Middle Ages were outside the town where we, the, the nuns could also support them, themselves in farming. But by the Renaissance, but in any case, after the sack of Rome, they, turned, they were put inside the city as close as possible to to the center of the town, specifically to protect the nuns who have a specific reason to, um, to retain their virginity because of their marriage to Christ. Um, the, uh, uh, right, I don't remember cases of self-mutilation um, done at, I, don't, I, I didn't think about it, but that's a good, a good question and I'm going to think through that. <laughs> But I mean, it's an important question because of Montaigne is uh, thinking about the relativity of uh, concepts of beauty and, of course, uh, in relation exactly to this non-European uh, uh, <coughs> body, uh, body. So it's, it's, even if it's not a real thing, it's an important thing for uh, reflecting about what beauty and ideal means and that it's culturally constructed. Mm -hmm. Um, Montaigne, in fact, writes of Neapolitan women, if I remember, who, um, uh, whose parents mutilate in the sense that they cannot walk, and they are supposed to be more sexually enticing, as if all their sexual energies, since they cannot expand their swell, is concentrated on, on, their, oh, that's, on that's their parts. <laughs> <laughs> there was another question, sorry, in the background. Then, uh, Thank you for your lecture. Um, I presume to be the only one plastic surgeon in the audience, and so I can assure you, your, our lecture went deep to the roots of scientific rhinoplastic. So thank you very much for your uh, research. Um, I have just one question. Why a surgeon from Bologna, Talia Cozzi, writing his Decortorum Chirurgia per Incisionem, makes a dedicatio to Gonzaga. There is no feeling from Bologna to the Gonzaga area. And as you are a very well-known lecturer in Renaissance times, I would like to know your interpretation of this dedication. Thanks. Um, yes, a beautiful question because I wrote a book on it, <laughs> of Vincenzo Gonzaga. Um, the Vincenzo Gonzaga um, had some form of um, um, disfiguration in his face. Um, perhaps there was, um, um, it's unclear whether he had syphilis, perhaps 
other forms of sexual disease. Um, he had also tuberculosis, most probably, that in his case manifested itself in, in the skin rather than in other parts of the, or, or he had other issues. Um, so when he returned from a crusade um, that he abandoned because because he was useless as a, as a commander. <laughs> but he returned because he said he was very sick. And so he asked for um, a, a, a group of surgeons from uh, different universities, they usually use those from Padua, um, to come and have a super consultation on what was his problem. And one of the persons he consulted was Talia Kotze, because he had been already together with his own teacher, whom uh, is, I don't have the slides, but his name is Avanzi, or Avanzi, was already doing surgery in Padova. He had been uh, um, um, addressing uh, dermatological issues with uh, some form of balsam together with some mineral water that the patient needed to use. Um, now, um, we don't know from that visit whether he went to mantra to address uh, um, also syphilis, but we have a letter from Vincenzo Gonzago saying, uh, please bring that balsam that you cured my uncle who died of syphilis. So it might be the, the, the thing. But also Vincenzo Gonzaga is uh, um, it's one of the Renaissance princes most interested in beauty in all form of arts. If you think of it, the pastoral comedy was pretty much invented in his court. Uh, he pursued uh, Giambattista Guarini uh, to do a pastor fido for his second marriage. It was an the comedy, but he did a number of pastorals in his court. He employed Monteverdi, and so opera was discovered in his court with the Ariana. Um, he was a great collector of art, and uh, he, also his wife, who was one of the Medici family, was a collector of Tuscan art. He, they, specifically, there are many letters they wanted a Raphael, they never got it, they got a Sebastiano da Piombo. And uh, so he, uh, uh, and he was also very fashionably dressed to the point that people were imitating the kind of lifestyle, the kind of, of uh, clothes that were um, uh, typically um, worn by him. So um, if there is an ideal patron, uh, that could very well be um, uh, Gonzaga. And also, he was, Gonzaga was a spendthrift, and most probably, uh, he, so much a spendthrift that he went bankrupt. Okay? So um, most probably, he also sponsored the, um, the publication of the drawings that accompany um, the, the text itself. It's, it's about the, it seems to now that we have cases like Pericles, that the portrait was in profile because he had a disfiguration on the other part of it. So art as a sort of uh, coming before uh, the, the, the surgery in the sense of providing a beautiful face. But uh, my question is about your sources, if you have in, in those sources any reference to these anecdotes from art or anything about um, painting or restoration of, of statues. Any parallels in this kind of medical source that are coming from, from our theory? And it's just a, a question, really. <laughs> ah, no, I cioè, se okay. nelle If fonti che, che lei ha, nel Tagliacozzi e altre mm. cose, mm. se ha trovato dei riferimenti a esempi artistici di eh, mh, restaurazione di nasi, ad esempio di statue, oppure ritratti che abbelliscono. Se c'è un parallelo con le arti visive sì. o no? Ma ehm, ho mostrato delle immagini di Tiziano sull'idea che il naso in quel periodo Infatti, era sì, più sì. di moda, si era più lunga, quindi chiaramente no, l'idea che eh, rifare il naso mh, era, un, era soltanto perché um, mancava e quindi esteticamente senza naso non si riesce a capire se la persona è, è di sesso maschile o femminile. Quindi non era, era un intervento estetico perché l'uomo è fatto a figura di Dio e, e, il, e il chirurgo infatti è, è la persona che, che, che play the God, no? ma al tempo stesso eh, non, non si rifaceva il naso come si, si fa adesso per un ideale estetico, no, no, eh, eh, si rifaceva per correggere una parte mutilata del corpo. Quindi si cercava di capire come eh, certe parti, per esempio l'idea 
se si prende il, del tessuto dalle braccia e crescono i peli, cosa si fa di quel, di quel pelo? No, no, capito, ecco, sì, se, sì. se è bene, per esempio, che la persona sia diciamo, abbronzata, in modo da avere un naso più scuro, perché, una pelle più scura perché il naso di solito poi diventa molto bianco, e di solito, cioè in quel periodo quando si faceva ogni nasi. Quindi l'idea estetica, sì, c'era un canone estetico. E, e il naso era, eh, e quindi i chirurghi cercavano di seguire quel canone, però chiaramente non è che veniva fuori un naso molto, eh, molto bello. Chi usava per sostituire eh, al naso, chi usava invece eh, del, del eh, rame, eh, delle, insomma, delle forme di rame oppure di, eh, di pelle, ecco, in quel caso credo che loro seguissero di più un ideale estetico perché potevano modellarlo meglio. Ma il chirurgo in sé, visto che lo doveva mettere il naso, invece di ricostruirlo da dentro come si fa adesso, chiaramente aveva degli ideali estetici che forse non poteva veramente indirizzare, anche se è chiaro che tutti i medici erano umanisti in quel periodo, infatti alcuni hanno scritto anche trattati di letteratura. Ho risposto alla sua domanda? Sì, sì, okay. no, mi no, sembra che se mai ne parliamo dopo. Se. Sabine. Bologna uh, era un very important place. Um, Taglia Cozzi, uh, Fiore Avanti, why was there a highly developed experience of the, in the technical and aesthetic level or was there a particular uh, estate, uh, ideal of beauty? I remember that uh, during the Renaissance in Bologna uh, had been accorded a lot of attention to social life and to, to elegant behavior and so on. Is there a link with this ambition and uh, this technical uh, know-how? Um, well, the, there were two, and only two, medical schools, Padua and Venice, excuse me, Padua and, um, and, and Bologna. So the best doctors were clearly from there. In the case of Tagliacozzi, um, there was no corresponding doctor, corresponding doctor doing the surgery at University of Padova, although the letter in which he explained how he was going to do was published in a book by Mercuriale, who was a professor of medicine in Padova. Um, the, uh, the reason why Vincenzo Gonzaga asked for Tagliacozzi, uh, published Tagliacozzi book also was because the doctor who uh, was um, the, uh, um, the previous doctor in the University of Bologna, Avanzi, he had intervened in a particular problem that, uh, 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 that Vincenzo Gonzaga had relating to the consummation of his marriage. So, in a sense, the, 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 the doctors from Bologna were already um, uh, considered at par with the doctor at the University of Padova. Um, now, the, whether Bologna had a better ideal of, of beauty, um, I would say no, because the best ideal of beauty in time were in Venice at the end of the 16th century and previous to that were in, in, in Tuscany. But already, I suppose, um, the, 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 uh, the ideas of um, the aesthetics were very much in mind in academia. So the, the doctors or the best university would be the one who would most probably be involved in endeavoring operations or even useless operations because this is, this is one that uh, um, it actually is the first case, I would say, of uh, performing surgery when it's totally unnecessary from uh, the point of view of survival. I would just like to go back to the question of uh, Sabine Flommel. Technically spoken, you have the difference between the five natural things and the six non-natural things, and as well the basics of medicine. So, coming back to her question, I mean you have in plastic surgery a huge impact of both uh, things, because on the one hand you have well the five natural things, which is officially seen that one is damaged with a broken nose, whatever. The other thing is you have a kind of, how to say, that behavior which influences, so it's not, how to say, divided completely, but it's normally th uh, regarded, considered something that interferes. So the question is, which kind of beauty are we talking about? I mean, as you mentioned, 
Venice is definitely uh, the city, the university, where corporal beauty is the main focus. But coming back to your question, are we speaking here about moral beauty, which is in the focus of uh, the Bologna School of Medicine? So we would have uh, not only, let's say, a better beauty or a less beautiful beauty, but we have two different concepts of beauty, which are related to different techniques of surgery and different concepts of medicine. I'm not sure I can answer your question, um, whether there was an aesthetic difference uh, there was in beauty in, uh, between uh, Venice and, uh, and Bologna. Um, this kind of surgery, it's uh, only partially aesthetic. Essentially, you're talking of repulsive pe people who try to pass as men in a society that would otherwise either read sin in their, uh, in their faceless nose because they would read disease, syphilis, or they would read them being as litigious, having lost in a duel, or, you know, or victimized by war, and therefore they um, the, you can say that the, the, uh, the reason to choose this kind of surgery was to, um, to reacquire for themselves a morality that would otherwise have been lost during to their own uh, circumstances. Um, I'm not, the, the, the reason for the surgery would be beauty in the sense that you would want an individual being to be like God has made him. But at this stage, we are not in, talking of beauty. We are simply talking of remedial surgery, of a, of a way for an individual to remain uh, as part of the beauty of the world, of the natural beauty. So um, although there were ideals of beauties that uh, clearly art was espousing, but philosophy, literature, um, and this idea of beauty was connected to morality, and I cited the, ca the case of Castiglione. At this time, um, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, not the overriding reason to perform surgery. Um, the idea of beauty, however, became important only after World War I, not even in World War I, when essentially to reintroduce men with horrible facial uh, uh, disfiguration into society and to allow them to have a job, it was important to reconstruct the, the disfigured figures. Later on, or actually even early on in, uh, in, uh, in the United States, surgery was specifically asked for beauty reason, if you want, by two categories. And one was the Jewish people, as I mentioned, and the other one was the Irish people, especially in cities like New York, for opposite problem. The, the Jewish to diminish their nose and the Irish to increase their nose size. Because the idea was that they would need to pass as Aryans or pass as American. And from then, um, when it was established that you could make a person more beautiful, and this is only when the person had the nose, because there is no case of noseless people now unless you're in a war, that the women who decided in order to be better part of the society, to marry better, whatever is the reason, then they would uh, go to plastic surgery only for beauty. And the ideal of beauty today is one that keeps changing. For example, the nose today is shorter than the one in the Renaissance because people want the nose at Elizabeth Taylor, I don't know. So the idea of so beauty changed, but the, uh, the fact is that gender-wise, men are, start, are starting to ask for uh, cosmetic surgery, beauty surgery, um, but the category that actually uses it most is, uh, is the women. Yeah, I have one question, one question, and I would like to add one small thing. The first is, is there any relation between plastic, in Renaissance, in between plastic surgery and youth? So, I mean, if we talk to nowadays on plastic surgery, is, it's because to, see, to, to look younger than one in reality is. So, you always find in the internet something like, this woman is 65, but she looks like 40 or something like that. And the other thing is, if I compare your lecture with all the others we heard today, especially that from Ulrich, the face, of course, is always a question of identity. So, Gnoti Zoya Oton or 
know yourself or but today it's over so the the face is not if you want the analogy what is inside yeah and this is interesting because a lot of movies use plastic surgery as a motive especially in uh, in the 30s and 40s gangsters always want to change <laughs> their face because they don't want to be uh, uh, seen as the person they are and so this is something which frequently is uh, used in 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 movies nowadays to to face off like movies like that people change completely their face to to have a new identity um i would say that there is no case i encountered of uh, um, plastic surgery like we're making the nose or the lips uh, in order to become more youthful or more beautiful. I only know the case of a woman, and she had surgery in Switzerland by a doctor called Jean Griffon, and he had studied in Bologna and in Padua at the same time. So for some reason, she was missing her nose. The idea was simply to try to live in the world, to appear human, and therefore was related and tied to money. If you had money, you do it. If you don't have, you don't do it. And that's why um, it was also connected. Um, uh, uh, slaves, for example, were not, um, if, if uh, they had to be punished, there would be different way to punish them. Originally, it was, for example, also for criminals to cut off their hands, but then they could not be employed in services like rows in galleys, rowing in galleys, so they would be punished with something that would mark them, but not uh, make their, uh, um, uh, their investment, the economic investment in them diminished. And so cutting off a nose or cutting off a ear. Some of these techniques were also done by the Ottomans and therefore were, um, uh, uh, were uh, understood as being uh, something that, um, that makes the, the powerful one punch the inferior one, uh, but not killing the economic potential. This is for, we, for men. The women, as I said, they did not undergo plastic surgery then for the specific reason that it had not been identified as beauty surgery and, uh, and uh, or women didn't have the money uh, and also they were married so early that the idea of, uh, of being um, youthful uh, and marriageable uh, as it, it is today would not be pertinent at the time. Now we have reached our working temperature because there's another question by Fabian Jonitz. I was wondering about the relation of um, aesthetics and the functionality of the body because the, the original ideal of medicine is to, to preserve the, um, the, the, the human body is working, um, to, to give back, to restore abilities of the, um, of the bodily functions. And if I understood it right, um, for example, replacing a nose doesn't better the, the ability to smell or something like this, especially in, in this period. Whereas in other cases, for example, when you replace in a lost ear, it doesn't only look better, but it also um, uh, um, strengthens the possibility to hear. Um, but this, if I'm right, um, just happens very much later when there's the possibility also to replace in the ear. So uh, um, could you please say something about um, when uh, a possible discussion about the relation of an aesthetic appearance and also the, um, the functions of the body um, appear and when this becomes a topic for medicine? Yeah, um, I had to cut some part of this paper because of time, but um, one thing I just simply uh, talked for just a paragraph was the reason why the method, the Tagliacozzi method, disappeared. In fact, it was later on rediscovered, uh, I mean, reused as the Italian method by Germans, and then even recently in, in um, 20th, early 20th century American medicine, uh, was recommended as the Italian method. The reason why it disappeared, uh, why it was criticized to the point that universities declared that no medical school should teach how to do it, was because it was connected soon to moral and philosophy. 
One of the issues is, like today, for a long time actually, when you had a heart transplant, people would say, does the person feel the same, or feels like the person whose heart belonged first? So the idea is, if you, um, uh, let's say you're a rich person, and you buy a nose from, uh, from, uh, by cutting a slave, and the slave dies, do you uh, die, or does the nose die of the slave? This is the sympathetic theory that was, uh, uh, was just a philosophical debate at the time. So the, um, because at the time the idea uh, of remaking facial feature was not an idea connected, uh, was born from aesthetic but not aesthetically uh, pleasing, it somehow when morality and philosophy went against it, it was abandoned and only recovered when the, there were a possibility to address um, surgeries that were not necessary. So when the ether, for example, had been discovered, the Lister, the Listerine, you know, the Lister had, um, had created the ways for people to survive the surgery itself. It is all at this point that started slowly to be connected with aesthetic results, uh, rather than necessary way to make the human being belong to the society where he, where he was. And uh, um, the, the backlash against Tagliacozzi has been such that, in fact, even today, many people think that the plastic surgery was invented two centuries later. So my point was to recover one more thing for Italy. <laughs> and uh, the book, it's clear, there was no book written after him. It is fully illustrated. My own university has bought one for 20 Six thousand euros last week. So, um, so I hope uh, Natalia Cotti's name remains forever. Did I answer your question? Partly. Okay. <laughs> I think we thank you, Valeria, very much for this brilliant talk again. Thank you.